hashtag C3T. You will now, and now we're going to move on to the content. I prepared something from Wikipedia. Let's see if this is going to work out. The Information Freedom Act belongs to everyone the right to access official documentations and information from offices. Um, you do not need to give a reason for why you want to access that information. I thought you guys would be laughing right about now, but that didn't really work out. Oh, well. I'm going to pass on the microphone uh, to the people who uh, know a little bit more about the Freedom of Information Act, the IFG in German. That's Anne Semsrott, Rainer Rehag, André Meister and Anna Biselli, who are going to do this talk now. Hello. Hi, everyone. I'm afraid we're going to have to talk about this democracy, about this democracy. Don't worry, I don't want to start the general, usual democracy discussion that was done in the media, uh, whether or not you should be talking to Nazis or whether you should invite them. No, you shouldn't, but you should talk more important questions with regards to democracy, such as the question, how can you basically create a democracy that it benefits a lot of people and that it um, prevents racists and people from the conservative side. That can, how can we invest in democracy? And an important measurement of this is the Information Freedom Act that on the country scale, it gives everyone the right to access information from the state and all sorts of information. You can, for example, call the city Tübingen and ask them what is the um, official um, ID of Boris Palmer, who is the um, mayor of the sound of tubing, and then you will get a response from him in personal. So there's all sorts of stuff that you can, uh, it's part of your civil rights, it's part of your right to participate in democracy, it's obviously related to uh, creation of will, and it obviously is supposed to be a way of controlling the state actions, and obviously also fight corruption. And I think it shows quite well what's the central aspect of this uh, IFG, the Freedom Act of Information. It's, it's supposed to be a democracy infrastructure. So that's what's cities for, uh, what's streets for the um, car system and, and infrastructure. That's what dem the Information Freedom Act is for democracy. So in this talk, we would like to cover um, how the use of this democratic infrastructure can be uh, sensible and useful. Raina, Andre, and Anna are going to give us some examples of this. And then afterwards, we want to cover um, how this infrastructure can be built further. And so in the beginning, we would like to do um, a view. What is the, uh, what's the, the scale at the moment for the Information Freedom Act? So we see three different categories where we have counties that do not have any of these uh, Freedom Acts. And we have the counties that have that sort of act. And then we have three counties that have a uh, transparency law. So you don't, where you don't have to um, file for an inf official inquiry, you actually have data that's provided by them. And this year, the uh, county of Hess has gotten uh, an, an Information Freedom Act. Uh, we'll hold your applause, because when you look at this applause, the CDU and the um, FDP, who are in charge in this, in this county, um, exempted all communal uh, um, departments, the police, which is in line with the police laws, because the police in Hess is uh, not supposed to uh, give any information. They're not, they're prevented, they're protected from this, and this is like a mystification of the police. And this kind of, this categorization that we used in the past doesn't really work anymore. So for, for, for Hess, we need uh, a new categorization, which is what we like to call the so-called um, categorization of the Information Freedom Act, so they get their new um, category, which is IFG in quotation marks. Um, um, otherwise, there's a couple of things that were done, but not in the speed that we like. In Berlin, for example, we have the coalition that up to this point still does not have uh, an example for a transparency law uh, and transparency act in Berlin. That's why we are starting going to start to collect uh, signatures in summer for um, uh, Oh, so 
So basically, we're trying to uh, gather enough votes so that we can, from the grounds, uh, get this pushed through further. So if we look at the European context, we can see a bit more how special it is to not have any um, Information Freedom Act. Uh, there's only white Russia, um, Austria, and Bavaria who don't have it. and. Bavaria, Saxony, and Lower Saxony um, are the only counties within Germany, so they're kind of aligned with, um, with uh, White Russia. And there's, a, there's a, something special about the infrastructure of democracy uh, in comparison to other infrastructures. It's not uh, kind of something that's getting worse by the time it's being used. It just gets better by it being used. So that's why we want to, in detail, want to give you three examples of how you can use this infrastructure and how you can strengthen it. Hello, hello. Hello, hello. All right. So my friendship with the Information Freedom Act is going back a few years now. I've never told this to anyone. But in 2011, I got a call from the Open Knowledge Foundation. You know about email. Can't you set up a mail server for us? We have this project. Ask the state, fragt den Staat, where you can ask for documentation from the state. All right, we're going to ask the state and beg for documents. I don't know how convinced I am if this is going to work, but I did it. And I was quite happy, and I have an account on this platform, and uh, I use it quite uh, frequently, and I like it, and a lot of times it, it causes result, good results, sometimes it doesn't, generates no results, but if you use this platform, asking the state has gotten so easy, if you stumble across something, you can be like, oh yeah, exactly, there's a document that's being mentioned, I can't find it, just, just maybe file for a small inquiry and you just need to get it sent to you. So for a lot of things, I have done this, especially for something like the state Trojan horse, it's my most favorite subject um, of the politicians, uh, to uh, make sure that uh, security officers police and such as can hack into machines and can access data uh, and uh, surveil this data. Here is a product uh, video of the product FinFisher from a German-British company that was bought by the German Criminal Police Department um, and we uh, asked for the contract. Uh, but this was officially first introduced uh, to fight international terrorism, terrorism and it was to prevent these sort of strong laws, uh, strong um, crimes. And uh, but then the parliament decided, well, if we have this kind of software, we might as well use it for uh, anything that is a severe criminality within everyday criminality. So what our goal, obviously, is to call, like get more transparency. So you have you bought the state Trojan horse. Why don't you give us the contract? So they were like responding, um, no. Um, all right, but we have this right uh, based on the Freedom of Information Act. So we filed uh, and sued them. And then we got the contract. And that is kind of what it looks like. It's kind of blacked out everywhere. But the, the, the um, filing this uh, complaint with the trial was very important. Um, and um, I also asked the police to um, to give us the contract, but then I was like, oh, I already sued you guys, uh, and then I got it, and it looks exactly pretty much like this. The Freedom of Information Act is obviously not the only way to access information. Um, there is uh, also a way where you can ask parliamentarians, because they can file inquiries and requests um, other uh, legislators, and they can ask questions that obviously you as a normal citizen can. And the, so the Green Party asked a question to the uh, government, um, did you, on a, from an academic scientific standpoint, research whether or not you need the state Trojan and in what cases you actually need it? So, um, but then they were like, no, we didn't really do that, but uh, we kind of uh, checked uh, with the uh, um, BKA, which is the German state police department, and they kind of uh, looked into cases where that would have been kind of nice to have. So, um, so um, then we were like, oh, well, we would love to see that document that you were using to do that. And so we were like, oh, let's file to for that uh, document. So then we had to wait, obviously, because... Uh, and then they have, usually they have um, a certain deadline where they have to give you the documents and then they don't. And once you exceed that, uh, that deadline, you can uh, push another button and then uh, they will uh, be reminded that they are supposed to send you this. And then you wait until day 50 and then I reminded them again. 
And then uh, afterwards, I was obviously doing a lot more research and, and other work on the side. Um, also das EFG ist eine der Möglichkeiten. So the Freedom of Information Act is one way of getting information. As a journalist, you obviously have other means and ways of getting documented. You have stuff being sent to you. In, in between, we got like uh, seven documents that were actually um, protected under security, and we got them sent to us. And um, my international, my my inquiry via the Information and Freedom Act um, was up until 100 day and seven without anything. So I got in touch with the Federal Criminal Police Office again. You are exceeding the deadline that you were supposed to be sending me this information on. And I got also in touch with the uh, uh, department that's uh, in, in charge of data protection and information freedom, and you can get in touch with them if you have trouble when uh, an inquiry is not being uh, dealt with, and then you can ask them and please look at my case. And uh, what's it said? Uh, I said, um, I am under the impression that this uh, inquiry was do dealt with because of um, unlawful things. Um, and then obviously uh, the next day we got um, an email from the from the federal uh, police department and, and and then they were like oh no we didn't get your email but the funny thing is with ask the state you can actually get an accept from the mail log where it says you got the email so it said and stated that uh, because we didn't get it um, that's okay that you didn't get it I can I can uh, give you a link to where you can read my uh, my question that I sent in and so I send you the link and you can look it up yourself and you all right and then you get your official um, official um, response that there's the document that you asked for and so we finally get the document that we asked for and now we obviously have to analyze this so what cases do we actually have where the security officers uh, would want to uh, use the state Trojan horse so um, this reads as follows. Uh, criminal acts um, as part of a criminal against for like something like child pornography, more than killing. Um, if you look at uh, criminal acts following by followed by death so we started with terrorism and then expanded it to this uh, but obviously these um, offenses are not actually mentioned in this uh, file that we got so um, half of the stuff that we were in that we saw in this document were uh, related to drugs and the other one were related to uh, people stealing and robbing um, so that was kind of uh, what uh, was kind of baffling for us um, that they obviously want to use the straight children horn mainly against um, drug related crime and um, stuff where, uh, in cases where things were stolen. Um, and I mean, this was a hundred days of research. <laughs> So, if there's anybody else that uh, surveillance measurements are only being used against terrorism and quite high crimes and strong crimes, this is what it's used against. So, from getting from um, hemp to bump, which is the um, office for um, migration, um, now on to Anna. Das Mikro, stimmt. Ja. Oh, the genau. microphone, yeah. Great. Andrea already said we're going to move to BAMF, the Ministry for Migration and Refugees, which is my favorite German agency. Um, and I think I also want to tell you about how you can create a personal relationship with institutions, um, which happens quite quickly if you continue to annoy them over the years. This started in 2015. That's when I asked the BAMF something for the first time. Um, you may remember that's when a lot of people fled to Germany. And I wanted to know, well, what happens um, if someone is uh, has a hearing for the first time? What do people ask them about? I don't even remember why I wanted to know this, but I also wanted to have the earlier versions of these questionnaires that they use. Um, so that was 2015, and then I got a call two days later by someone who was employed um, at BAMF and who was probably responsible for these FOIA requests. Um, he was like, Miss Bizelli, do you really want to see all versions? But that's a lot of work for me. Mm, oh well, I guess, well, I already have some. Then maybe just send me the current one. And then it actually came a week later. I was enthusiastic. It was amazing. And it came um, in a digital version. Within a week, um, I thought that was fair. That was quite nice. That was my first request. Um, then I didn't request anything from Bump for a while. But then it started again. 
Um, that was when I started working in my journalistic work on, um, at, that w w w at the time I was primarily sending uh, press requests rather than FOIA requests. And that's quite interesting because uh, you may think, oh, uh, journalists are so privileged they can ask these institutions all these things. But actually, in many cases, um, the Inf Freedom of Information Act is actually something that's much more reliable. But it also depends on the specific institution you're interacting with. Let's just take have a look at the Ministry of Defense, which I also um, have to deal with sometimes, because um, the Ministry of Defense um, is re a really great inter institution to interact with because they have a lot of humor, because sometimes they send you something um, and then they write on there by hand cyber information. I thought it was really nice that they wrote that on there by hand, um, because then you get a letter from them that says cyber information from the Ministry of Defense. And maybe just a quick, another quick story. Anna and I had another episode with the German army where Arne asked the um, army for a game that they created and they were like, mm, well, can't really do that. There's something about IP problems, but you can come here and play it with us. Um, so Arne and I actually went to um, the German army's canteen um, and played this game with a press officer and, and some other guy. We basically unpacked it unboxing-wise, like on one of those YouTube videos. And then at some point they were like, well, you know, these FOIA requests, they're pretty annoying. Can't you just send press requests? Well, no. Uh, FOIA requests are something that everyone should be able to ask, and we don't really like this whole thing about privileging the quest press. So in the case of the BAMF, you can also just send them press requests, and I knew there was a, there was a, a, a guidance that they'd given out that was, that was something about a speech recognition and speech analysis in terms of people who were requesting asylum. I wasn't quite sure what that said and what it was called, but I knew that it existed. So I asked for the title and asked them to send it to me. Um, there was a press request. Um, and they were like, no, that's only for internal use and not public. And then I was like, okay, guys, seriously, I've asked for other guidelines previously and you've given those to me, so I'll just send in a FOIA request. Um, so I, um, I asked them to, in uh, February 2018, said this is from 2017, and I got it around a week later, um, and I got it as an HTML file which um, because it sent out as an email, which is helpful because I could see who it was sent to. Um, which was interestingly not just um, sent to the regular um, BAMF employee mailing lists, but was also sent to the um, management consultancies that had advised the ministry to implement these systems. Very interesting. I've never seen anything like that. So that's um, zero to one for FOIA requests. You too should submit FOIA requests and not assume or wait for someone to report on it. My personal routine is me reading um, certain um, news and media kind of sites and document that they allegedly have and I'm like, oh, well, it can't be that secret. I'm going to request this document and then I can tell them, well, actually, this document which you're claiming is secret it's online now so let's continue I did a talk about this yesterday how the ministry um, trains its employees to use all these IT systems for um, dialect analysis and smartphone analysis um, in the very beginning I was primarily interested in how this dialect analysis happens and works um, and I wanted to know how these people who make decisions what kind of tools and information they get to interpret the output of these programs. So I told them, please give me everything. Um, it, I don't want it just to be limited to specific types of documents. I just want everything. Sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, and then I actually got an answer. Um, I got two internal guidelines. One was for asylum requests um, and how essentially they determine someone's identity. Um, and the, the guide, guideline... Um, for um, the secretariat that basically said exactly the same thing. And I was like, well, that's not so cool because I don't really think that's everything. <laughs> so maybe I need to rephrase this in a different way. So they really sent me everything. So I phrased it slightly differently. Well, now there was a parliamentary inquiry into this. Um, and now we know that there are, you have these trainings for your employees that are between four and eight hours. Um, and I basically assumed it would have been very weird if this was a government agency that, that doesn't create PowerPoints for its training. And so I basically asked for these documents. Um, so I know about these things. Please send me exactly that. Please send me everything. Please send it to me for, about all these tools that you train people on. <laughs> Similarly to Andre, I waited and was, okay, come on. Now it's really about time. You need to send me something. And then there was this pseudo scandal 
um, that was happening with the ministry where the ministry Banff was like, okay, we, our lawyers are currently quite busy. And I was like, okay, well, I can see that. And then four months later, um, I finally got an answer. And they basically said, we're sending the following doc documents, user uh, manual uh, training documents, um, and so on and so on. And that was August 2018. I was really happy. Um, then I continued to read and it said, well, you can't du duplicate or publish these or give them to other people, which is kind of funny because this is the Inf Freedom of Information Act because thousands of people can just ask for the same document and you can basically drive a DDoS attack on a ministry. Um, and then they basically often say, oh, okay, now you can publish it. And I was like, okay, I'm just not even going to start with that. Um, the bump did something really nice. They sent me... They basically wrote my PowerPoint slides for this Congress, and so I'm just going to publish these slides. And, well, you can have a look at that talk. But this is my favorite, favorite slide, which are um, these are different types of phones that people um, might encounter, including the, uh, the, the Nokia phone gun, which doesn't actually exist, but is a Photoshop. And then I looked at these um, documents a bit further, and I was I asked myself, when did I request these documents? Um, and you didn't even ask about user manuals? Um, and I was like, okay, I put out this request in April, and then you look at the dates here, when, when these manuals were created, and this was in June 2018. Oh, that's so nice that even though, that they basically created um, documents that tell me how to use these systems, even after I requested these documents. That's actually quite funny. You can now look at them on fragdenstaat.de, um, and most of these are basically copy paste. Um, so I got these for different, several different softwares, and you can basically say this is version uh, 1.0 because it basically tells you how to click things and it doesn't really tell you how to actually use these tools. We saw in the beginning, um, BAMF answered within a week. Then suddenly it took them four weeks, which I guess is also okay, but then suddenly it started to take much, much longer for them to respond, and they started just sending everything on paper and telling me that I couldn't publish things anymore. And for my last request, they had a even funnier idea, because I wanted to have their Dublin-related guideline, and they said, well, guidelines, um, we're going to include an IP clause and an uh, intellectual property protection clause. And it's not like there are few guidelines that are not public. Um, another German NGO also published one a while ago. And there has never been an IP clause in there, but now they started putting in IP clauses and saying this is intellectually protected, this is protected intellectual property, you can't publish this. this I think this is a interesting example of how um, IP law ca is used to essentially try to prevent publication <laughs> um, and to censorship. Um, and then basically, uh, you, if you look at the IP protection law, basically it says IP law, th these things are not sufficiently creative. There is not a lot of creation happening here um, when it's like basically a guideline from a government institution and, well, we're just going to publish this, which, well, it's our job and I would uh, highly recommend you do the same thing. Um, and just to close with another document that was quite important that I didn't ask, but Arne requested that. Um, this document shows that the supposed BAMF scandal, BAMF scandal, which was a pretty big deal in German politics earlier this year, um, wasn't actually a scandal. So people said that the ministry essentially grabbed asylum cases which they weren't supposed to be responsible for um, and that allegedly people got asylum who weren't supposed to get asylum. But by getting this document, we found out that actually that's not quite what happened because basically um, people who are requesting asylum can be moved and distributed across different instances and then can be explicitly sent. And these people were explicitly sent to Bremen, which was accused of having essentially taken these cases. For journalists, I think that's also really important. You you should see are there other documents and if they exist you should look at those and then if they exist you should I think you do sh think you should publish those because it shouldn't just be journalists who are allowed to interpret these documents but everyone should be able to read them and talk about them and interpret them so moving from um, IP law and censorship IP well, let's move to uh, places affected by a lack of transparency hello Hello. I'm speaking. Yes. There isn't, there seems to be an audio issue right now. We can't hear the speaker terribly well. We have an audio angel okay. coming to the stage. Oh, oh, okay, nice, very nice. So 
audio fressen we okay. had uh, places with audio issues so i will tell you about places affected by a lack of transparency there was one situation that happened in 2006 began in 2016 sometimes these things take a bit longer which is about the riga straße in berlin there were several conflicts beca between left-wing um, housing projects um, which are in these cases people who live there and pay rent um, and the police um, there were several clearances that actually turned out to be illegal in the end. Um, and in this public area there, there were suddenly there was suddenly an immense amount of police control in these ro roads surrounding that area. What do you do if you don't understand what the state is doing? You submit a FOIA request via um, askthestate.de and you ask them, well, what what's happening with this like allegedly especially criminal area and what happens? What can the police do because you designate this area as especially criminal? And then they tell us, well, okay, so the lo legal basis that they're basing this on is the general um, police law. Um, I actually work there, and so I've talked to people who have the experience of living there, and basically the experience is that the police um, randomly stops people, um, checks their identity, searches their things, um, including their strollers, their cars, and their bags. And my FOIA request was actually denied because I asked what is actually happening there um, and why are they allowed to do this was just denied without any waiting period. Um, the justification was quite interesting. For one, they said the right to actually have insight into document is only only exists. Um, uh, if, if it doesn't exist if you if this could prevent what the government is doing there to, from succeeding. And then it says that there is a se severe threat to the general well-being. And I was like, oh my God, what are they doing there that they can't tell me about this? Um, um, and then f a few weeks later you heard about me from the media that they found weapons such as strollers and well, yeah, words are the biggest weapons, I guess. And the justification of the police continued. Um, they couldn't respond this re to this FOIA request because otherwise they would have to admit that this area is an um, area that's specifically affected um, and saying that this area is, has a high rate of criminality would make people feel less secure. And people were telling me, basically, we have police cars here, we have hundreds of police people coming here, but you don't want to tell us on paper that we shouldn't feel safe in this area. Um, so this whole thing, this feeling about this feeling of insecurity that already exists, which is also created because people aren't told what's happening there. So the next justification was um, postscript was a postscriptum. Um, the government's actions cannot be calculable or uh, foreseeable. Okay. I well. I don't know whether that was a conversation within that police itself because sometimes that's yeah. In, on the left, we know what this looks like, but we were like, no, 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 this isn't okay. We have to we have to escalate. So we actually. Uh, with the aid of Ask the State, we uh, went to trial um, and submitted a FOIA suit, and we sued the Berlin police um, and basically asked for them publishing these documents to finally tell us what actually is happening there. Because you can't always afford a suit, um, we also asked for donations together with another NGO called FIF, and then we got another rejection from the police. And then we basically gave our question to our lawyer, um, including the justifications for the denials. And our lawyer, his reaction was basically, he was saying, well, there are um, severe possible consequences for the general well-being. And, and our response was, we just want to point out that the police Bremen um, also designates these dangerous areas and actually publishes the designated areas online, which where you can check online on their website where exactly, including the number of streets and when these areas are designated as dangerous and which parts of the population are considered dangerous. And so the way the public well-being um, is uh, limited, if you publish this information, can't, can't be that bad if Bremen does it. But point two, where they talked about how government's actions cannot be calculable or foreseeable, and our, our lawyer's response was basically, well, we're kind of astonished 
um, at this, where the people we're suing is essentially saying that a state action cannot be foreseeable. Um, they should maybe have a look at a general comment on the basic on Article 20 of the Basic Law, which basically says exactly the opposite. The Basic Law is the German Constitution. Um, I'm just going to translate this into non-lawyer German. One does not simply ignore a general comment on Article 20 of the German Basic Law. Fun fact, just on the side, um, so we sued the police while policemen and police women were basically complaining um, that they were being abused for an election campaign because they also didn't want to be there. So maybe sometimes you're actually on the same side as the police. Um, and then mid-2017, there was um, an oral hearing. They answered four of our five questions. Um, which included um, how areas were designated and the justification, but that wasn't five out of five, so we didn't quite win. Um, so basically, they said, well, one and a half years later, we can tell you, yes, this area is specifically a dangerous area with a high rate of criminality, and we're like, oh, really? Thanks. Um, well, I guess at least you're being honest. But then finally, the extent, like how big this area was, that was something that was missing. And then we actually had these really weird scenes in this hearing. We were like, well, why can't you just tell us the exact extent of this area? You just tell us until which road, which street it goes. Ah, oh, but all these criminals, if they knew where they're line is, they would just move 30 centimeters and then they will commit crimes there and then we can't control them. Okay. <laughs> well, so I was thinking of uh, this uh, Simpsons scene and this other point was, this was about, the, uh, it was specifically about a housing project in Riga Straße and there was like, how do you move crimes that happen around a housing project, which is static, but well, so uh, result for now, or at that point was that there was a structural improvement um, that was obviously not just because of us, there were other people who were working on this and other people asking for this information, but the red-red-green coalition in Berlin actually changed the guidelines. Um, the, the date is a bit confusing, this was after our hearing, and they basically said, well, yeah, these areas designated as having a high rate of criminality and of dangerous areas, all of this will be published live now um, and will be published online, so there are actually structural changes and this information is now available freely online. That's pretty cool. We also had media coverage about this before. And now um, we are appealing this decision and this uh, appeal is ongoing and has started 2016 and is ongoing as of 2019. And so we want to thank our lawyer and we want to ask, uh, we want to thank ask the state, um, Julian Kruger, Marco Mitter, Paul Geigerzeller and the people who helped us with their donations to actually enable this whole thing to happen. Related to this, there's two aspects that I would like to stress on. One, uh, the information is interesting that you gain, but also the information that you don't get. So one example for this is the uh, Afghanistan state of um, relations right now. We asked for that um, in this with the Defense Department, and we wanted to, uh, we asked for this, and we got it back, and it looked a bit like this, and it looked like that, and I think that... That, that's quite telling. This blackout is showing very well what the current state of human rights and security is in Afghanistan. I think an interesting detail on this report is that the security report in 2007 was supposed to be done in 2007 because of a terroristic attack on the German embassy, but it could only be finished in 2018. So if you will talk about uh, deportations to Afghanistan right today, this is uh, inhumane politics that you're doing. The second... A second aspect that is quite interesting to me is that the Information of Freedom Act doesn't make you get information, but you also get copies of original files. I have a good example for this. There is uh, is a copy from the Foreign Ministry uh, about the refugee situation in Libya um, that writes that there is an 
refugee camp that's similar to former concentration camps. And that, as a quote, is quite impressive. But when you see the document with the logo from the foreign from an office affair and this this the sentence where it says that it's it's similar to concentration camps and you really know how, how far down the, the line we are. So this is how you can use these democratic infrastructures and how you can further uh, use this and build it up. And this is obviously not just uh, by the Information of Freedom Act, there's the ecosystem, there's other laws that are related to it, there's obviously also this. Um, law that was introduced in 1933 by the Nazis that today is 2000, paragraph 2019 and this is about inf freedom of information on um, abortions. The Nazis introduced the paragraph 219A in May 1933 and for the uh, criminal law book what I think what should count that today is that uh, Nazis out and they should also be out of our law books and that's why this law should be abolished. Uh, the Information Freedom Act is going to be changed soon. There is a response to an inquiry we filed. Uh, we don't yet know what's going to be changed, but it's going to be changed. We don't. I, I don't know because I'm retiring tomorrow. Correlation, not uh, causality. So we don't know what's going to happen, but this law is probably going to uh, be more restrictive by the uh, current inner ministry. Um, but independently from this, we want to look at how we can further build this. And so we st started a campaign where we wanted all lobby statements, so the first process of making law, that that should be made public. And we went to talk to the ministries and started with, um, and we were like, why don't you publicize? And they were like, well, thank you, and didn't do anything. So that's why we did, why don't we start something new? So we wanted to do something. So we built a database with 70,000 documents with um, different uh, statements by lobbyists and uh, people who uh, were holding speeches. So we made that public. So why don't we make all these documents um, accessible and within a week we got 2,000 requests and uh, sent them to the government. <laughs> and it showed it is super effective. And the ministries uh, took three weeks and then uh, published all these documents themselves. There was no decision yet, however, how this was going to be done and dealt with in the future. This was a, a decision for past decisions. So this year we uh, went up to them again. Why don't you publish these documents? Because otherwise we'll start this campaign again. So in November, the ministries decided that they will um, publish all speaker um, files and uh, lobby statements. And we were kind of intrigued by this playful attitude towards this. So we're like, how can we get the ministries more to our side, more to over to our side? So then we started this championship of Information of Freedom Act. So the principle here is that we are taking an inquiry for all the different departments and whoever answers first gets a round further ahead and that was super interesting that was a super interesting um, game to watch like this competition was super interesting like all the different matchups this one was quite interesting the foreign ministry bet uh, the BMZ and that, I think, was the first time where the SPD could beat the CDU. Uh, and we tweeted on about this live, and we tried to kind of draw in the ministries, and all of them responded. It was super interesting. There was a ministry that, within a day, they responded to us. So they really took well to our like playful attitude towards this. Uh, so we tweeted that, and uh, we're really excited. A day after, Horst Seehofer reached the semi-finals, and Horst Seehofer responded with it. <laughs> and uh, and um, in round two, I think there was one ministry that called me and they called me and were like, did you get it? Did we get one further? Did we get a round further ahead? It was brilliant. And um, then we 
did a trailer for the finale because we wanted to show this, but I think the GEMA is somewhere in the room and we can't play this music because otherwise we'll be have to uh, pay a fine. So that's why we're doing the music live for you now, because then it's just prevented from us having to pay GEMA. And GEMA needs to die so that we can finally stream this and you don't have to listen to us humming. Are you ready? Please. Big applause from the audience for this beautiful performance. Stefan Wehrmeier. Stefan Wehrmeier joined Arna on stage. He is the founder and developer for Frag den Staat, the website where you can file your own uh, FOIA requests. Who won? Anja Kalicek won. Um, so did she get a trophy for this? for winning. Yes, of course she got a trophy. She got the trophy looked something like this. All right. So the most interesting aspect of the story is that how these ministries in social media were acting, especially the Ministry of the Interior, that was all happening at the same time to the master plan of migration to this affair. For many times we tried to request this and then we leaked that there was the CDU version and the BMI version. And we were like, do they have something to do with one another? We don't really know. So the Ministry of the Interior was quite under fire for this. Well, of course, you kind of uh, created this inhumane document. All right, let's do something great new on social media. So we created this new hashtag called Ask the Minister. So all people could send a tweet to the Minister uh, Ministerium uh, for the Interior, and he answers them personally. And the most Que um, most question, the question most asked was this one. Um how do you want to respond to this question? And then the response was, this is a question that we don't really, um, we don't really ask. So this is, has nothing to do with freedom of information. So we're going to look at this a bit closer. And we're like, let's, what are they doing on Twitter a lot more? What they do quite often is they ask users if they could send them a direct question message, a DM. So we were like, let's let's get the DMs. Brilliant. Why can't we? We can ask for emails. We can ask for DMs. So the Ministerium of the uh, Ministerium of the Interior said no. So we we're like, new no. hashtag sue the minister. So um, we. Uh, filed suit against the Ministeri Minist uh, Ministerium for the Interior and I think this uh, inquiry, this FOIA request and the, the, the suit, suit that we brought about was it's very interesting, it's not just about the general, about private platforms such as Twitter, uh, Facebook, WhatsApp groups should be accessible. Uh, for now, this, the focus is very much uh, towards the file, the physical file, and it's obviously not very uh, contemporary anymore. And uh, the file, so the, the suit so far has um, has this correspondency can does not have to be filed with the same kind of um, carefulness. Um, and you can see quite well what their attitude towards it is. You don't really have to uh, file your your. Um, you don't have to do due diligence, due diligence, due diligence any more diligence for um, the, the kind of conversations that happen on these private platforms. So the most German thing that exists is that German offices from acts from Germans abroad and in the state file due due diligence. 
diligence. Sorry, guys. So, I mean, obviously, we hope that the in the next year that there's going to be a trial. And uh, there's a few uh, suits that we brought to the end. We had um, the, the, the Parliament of Rheinland-Pfalz that did not want to hand over uh, files for us uh, from all sorts of parties were fighting that. And we won, and uh, we won in the first instance and in the second. And um, for two months ago, we got these uh, reports, and the head of the parliament uh, said, well, if these um, reports are published, um, obviously there's going to be uh, pressure to uh, justify, um, and then we have to justify in the public, why we have done and come to certain conclusions and decisions. Obviously, that would be horrible if that would have to, that that would take place. But all these reports are now uh, public, and we uh, also won uh, another suit with um, the federal council um, because you could only in the official documents how counties and how elections came about. You couldn't see who. Um, decided for what, so we then um, asked all the counties to publicize um, how they came to a decision, and um, so we went to uh, Sachsen-Anhalt and asked uh, for the last um, meeting and the meeting before that, and we would always get uh, uh, we would always get their um, their reports on how decisions were made, and you can obviously do the same. There is uh, still a phone that you can uh, donate to, which is called Transparency Suits Transparenzklagen.de. There's a couple of suits that so far have not had their for, like official trial yet because everybody is completely over exhausted, and that's why all of these things are taking so long. And that's I think why this is really important. Why who has to sue more? And I think that's the public offices that have to do. More more because we looked at how many they, they suits they brought about and if uh, as the state sues more than the public broadcasting systems of Germany then something is going very wrong and and with that, I would like to come to the conclusion that's called Living Democracy, and it's called like that because there is a program done by the by the country of Germany. It's called uh, Living Democracy. There's 100 million euros that is supposed to d give money to um, support democracy infrastructure. We've worked quite up a few things and um, published a few things that are related to this, and it states that every state um, the inappropriate usage of uh, public provisions doesn't only have to be efficient, effectively excluded and prevented um, but the ministries basically also are allowed to look into this um, and these different ministries use this quite a lot um, they actually there were 51 organizations which they passed on to the German Secret Service um, to have them check whether these organizations um, uh, deserve a democracy um, a democracy, democracy seal of approval, essentially. So basically, in this case, the Secret Service, so the, in this case, the Federal Office for the Protection of the Institution, the Verfassungsschutz is who gets to decide who is democracy, dem democratic. Um, you may remember this person, Christina Schröder, former Minister of Families, um, was actually interested in an um, cla extremism clause where she, we wanted everyone who, for example, adopts kids to sign a non-extremism clause. And that was something that we got rid of because so many civil society organizations opposed this. What did the Ministry of Families do in response to that? Then they were like, oh, well, now we're going to try it with this guy. Um, Hans Georg Maaßen and his friends with the AFD ultimately decided uh, within um, the Verfassungsschutz whether they basically decided whether an organization could, could get this um, seal of approval or not. We wanted to know more about this. And they were like, well, this is secret service, so it's secret. Um, so we don't even know how this so-called Office for the Protection of the Constitution actually decides um, whether uh, an organization gets the seal of approval. They just get a yes or no. They give that to the Ministry of Families. And there's this basically black box. We don't know how these decisions are made. So we approached the ministry again and basically asked for the names of those 51 organizations. They refused, they rejected that request, and I was invited 
um, um, into the Ministry of Families to the person who was um, in charge of the relevant um, section of the ministry. He was like, please um, distance yourself from this request because it wouldn't be good for anyone involved in this if this came out. I was like, oh, that sounds interesting. <laughs> So we sued um, because we want to know the names of these 51 organizations. And then the response to this suit, we got that five days ago. If you read that, that's extremely remarkable. remarkable. That's um, uh, It was written by an external uh, law, law, legal law, law, law firm. Um, so basically the ministry used tax money to pay this external law firm to write this justification. They argue that essentially if these organizations' names are published, then public security will be endangered. Why? Because then fewer organizations will be um, will send in requests to the Ministry of Families. And this is their response. Um, if we publish these organizations' names, um, then then other people who uh, want to implement projects might also be mistrustful of the ministry. The basis for a trust-based cooperation could be destroyed doing this. So they're basically saying, the ministry says, if it comes out, what do we actually do? Then you can't trust us anymore. And... I think that's extremely remarkable that they don't even deny that this is extremely problematic to work with the Secret Service, but rather than drawing the relevant consequences and saying we don't, won't do this anymore, they're just like just saying, well, we'll just keep it secret. I think if that's their idea of democracy that the Ministry of Families has here, we need to maybe teach them what it means to actually live democracy. And that's um, we're going to get to our concluding section with that. We have a pretty big backlog of investment. I think that's what you call these things um, when you talk about, for example, uh, internet infrastructure. I just don't mean the, I don't mean this just in a in a financial way, but also in a practical way. Um, because the democ democracy infrastructure gets better when you use it. So um, if you ask, if you sue, this, this infrastructure improves. We can do that together and with, those, with that, thank you very much. We have eight minutes for questions and answers. If you have questions, go find a microphone. We're going to try to get as many questions in as possible. Number two, you get the first one. Is this mic on? Ich schnack hier einfach weiter rein. Ja, uh, I'm just vielen Dank erstmal für den Talk. Talk. Es so war sehr Talk. erfrischend, wie immer. Ihr macht geile Arbeit. Ich habe jetzt kurz eine Frage, Anna. Du hattest diese Folie gezeigt, wie viele andere Klagen ihr ja noch am Laufen habt. Dann habe ich gesehen, dass ihr eine Bergbaugesellschaft verklagt. Kannst du dazu ein bisschen was erzählen? Das hat mich neugierig gemacht. Das hat mich neugierig gemacht. In mining industry, that, there's a mining industry suit that's, oh, that's the LNBV, yeah, v, yeah. That's the LNBV company which we're suing, which is responsible for mining after, um, so after restructuring and restoration, so they restore um, areas in the Lausitz, a part of, part of Germany, and we sued them because they said, um, we don't actually have to tell you anything, but we're saying this is basically a company that's 100% state-owned. So at least based on the Freedom of Information Act, they actually obliged to give us information as well. because And that's one of those basic, um, basic principle suits, because we basically want to make sure that we have written, written down by court that these institutions also need to answer our requests. All right, we're going to start with the internet and then afterwards the aid. Uh, one question is, are there cases where um, FOIA requests caused for um, restrictions, re repercussions? Paying money is a repercussion, right? It's pretty expensive. Um, well, I think that's a good point. Um, 
What's important to us is that you can send in requests sooner, and anonymously as well, and that's a really big point of discussion that we've had for the past few years, especially with the Ministry of the Interior. We think that if we don't, if you don't want a government agency to know your name, you should use, be able to use a pseudonym to put in a FOIA request. The Ministry of the Interior disagrees with that. And there was one case um, by Jan Kuciak, he's a Slovakian, Slovak journalist, who was killed because of a FOIA request. He and his fiancée, what happened was that he sent a FOIA request to a Slovak agency based on their Freedom of Information Act and basically included his name and his address. Um, and that was about this whole uh, request was about organized crime. What did the ministry do? It sent it to the people who were affected by this, by organized crime. And they were like, well, can we tell them their name? By the way, this is the request. And that's how his name and his address came out. And that's probably why he was killed and murdered. And that's why it's really important to us that the people who don't want to submit a FOIA request under their own name should be able to, fi you can find someone who makes that request for them, such as us, but they should also be able to do it pseudonymously. No, microphone number eight. Yeah, hello, my Hi, one question. My question is super similar. Um, you are kind of joking about this, but how expensive are these FOIA requests? Like, for example, for the competition. Oh, for example, for this competition, the requests, all of them were free. But in general, um, agencies ask, are allowed to ask for up to 500 euros of fees, especially for large requests. They usually do that to scare you away, but you can usually kind of like negotiate that down, maybe even down to zero euros. Um, what's even more expensive are um, lawsuits, which is why we have this um, pot where we collect donations for lawsuits. Um, for example, there was one case in Rheinland-Pfalz where we paid 3,000 euros, although we won the lawsuit. Number four, please. Um, yeah, danke. Right, thank you. Um, Vielen Dank für eure heldenhafte so Arbeit. Ich habe die Frage, ob es so Trotzreaktionen gibt zwischen is, den Behörden, um, ob die miteinander reden sozusagen und sagen, ja, den kennen wir schon von der anderen Behörde kind of from und, uh, and oder so. and they just kind of refuse to answer <laughs> on these grounds. Do you want to say something um, about that? Um, sometimes I'm not sure whether some of us don't get information more quickly because government agencies know that we're going to sue them. I think it can be helpful to have some kind of reputation with government agencies. But we also know that although it's not allowed, they also talk and exchange information between agencies, despite this actually not being allowed. I actually got um, a response from a Ministry of uh, Agriculture to a request that I sent to the Ministry of Health because they internally passed that on. But we also have this like general standard sentence in our requests. Um, we, uh, we, we, uh, we don't want our names to be essentially passed on. Hi, thank you so much for the talk. Um, um, Liebe Leiden, I'm I Bundesland, I live in a kind of county EFG where we don't have a, an information of Freedom Act. Uh, do you know what the state of things is? Bavaria, Saxony, Lower Saxony. So in Bavaria, they're saying in their coalition, no, Lower Saxony, the, they're saying that they want to have a Freedom of Information Act um, as part of the coalition, but the Conservative Party is not sufficiently interested in it. So I think it might make sense to remind the Social Democratic Party. Um, in Lower Saxony, new government, they have no interest in implementing such a law. Their coalition agreement basically says they want to evaluate how this worked in other federal states. Um, and in Bavaria, the free uh, the free voters essentially said that they want to implement um, a freedom of information law, but it wasn't, they didn't, they didn't manage to convince the Conservative Party there in a coalition with to put that into the coalition agreement. So based on that, I think the uh, landscape of uh, Freedom of Information Acts will look similar to this year, next year. All right, question from the internet. Uh, how is it with uh, companies that 100% uh, owned by the state, such as the German train company? Not for the Freedom of Information Act, but the uh, environmental information law, because when we're dealing with the environment, which is a pretty broad term, everything is kind of loud and stinky, then the environmental information law applies. And then um, companies that are owned by the, by, the, by the German state 
uh, might be affected, which includes, for example, the German train company. Um, so I think once once you're affected by this particular law, that's the case. All right, that's the last question for this talk, and this comes from number three. I would like to know, uh, you mentioned in ersten Entwürfe und the Lobby äh, Einbringungen in Gesetze mit veröffentlichen wollt von den Ministerien und da wollte ich wissen ob das jetzt eine Richtlinie like ist die von der nächsten law, Regierung einfach wieder zurückgenommen werden kann oder ob es da Möglichkeiten gibt uh, das auch in ein Gesetz zu gießen dass es nicht ohne weiteres wieder transparenter wird That's a great question. There was um, a cabinet decision, and that's, how do you say this? Usually these decisions from within the cabinet are implemented further, um, even beyond that particular legislative period, and I think it's a good sign that it was done in the beginning of the legislative period. I think once you already, ha once you finally have a standard and a baseline of transparency, then it's very difficult to go back below that standard. But what doesn't happen is that they um, put these things into uh, the general operational standing orders of the. German government, and that was best of Informationsfreiheit or best of freedom of information. And Arne Semsrott.